and Executive Director of CRASC, um, the Center for um, Sustainable and Resilient Communities. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Start Tides Fireside Chat. This meeting is being recorded. Excuse me? Uh, if you're, yeah, can you mute yourself, please, if you're not? Uh... Okay, we're going to unmute. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. I want to welcome you to the Star Tides Fireside Chat. My name is Paul Hauser, and I serve as the director for the Center for Resilience and Sustainable Communities, or CRASC, at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. CRASC is a transdisciplinary research center that addresses critical real world problems through integrated approaches that build resilience. Should we do slide two? An acronym for sharing to accelerate research, transformative innovation for development and emergency support. This is StarTides. It's a global knowledge sharing network that focuses on, focuses on building sustainable resilience, promoting human security or freedom from want and freedom from fear and creating life-changing social economic opportunities. StarTides was established in, in 2007 at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. And today, Star Tides is coordinated through CRASC. Next slide. Star Tides is financially supported through generation, generous donations. We invite you to support our efforts by visiting the CRASC website, click on give and write Star Tides under additional comments about your gift. Thank you. Now to our program. Dr. Lynn Wells, who founded Star Tides 15 years ago, serves as CRASC's executive advisor. After graduating from the United States Naval Academy, Dr. Wells served over 50 years in the Department of Defense, including 26 years uniformed service in the Navy where he retired as a captain. As a resident of Fairfax, Virginia, Dr. Wells received a Master's of Science in Engineering in Mathematical Sciences and a PhD in Political Science and international relations from John Ho Johns Hopkins University. Aaron Rose is the founder and managing director of Global Tactics, a strategy advisory firm residing in San Jose, California. Aaron serves as chair of the Star Tides Advisory Board. The Star Tides Fireside Chat is produced in collaboration with the Silicon Valley Forum, a global tactics initiative that fosters innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership in Silicon Valley throughout and throughout the world through events, programs, and conferences. Aaron, over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hauser, and thank you to everyone uh, taking a few minutes of their uh, afternoon or their evening, and I think a couple of people early in the morning uh, and uh, being part of this discussion. Um, this is the uh, third or fourth installment of our fireside chat. And, uh, and, and today's discussion uh, really will get into uh, about the interconnected disruptions and how, what StarTides does and, and, and how we operate. Um, and we've got Lynn Wells, uh, Dr. Wells, uh, who, who founded uh, StarTides uh, 15 years ago. Um, but uh, I, I do want to throw out the first question to you, Lynn. And, and, and of course, this is an interactive discussion. So uh, for anyone who have questions, you know, we can uh, unmute you or put them in the chat. But I, I do like, uh, you know, if you have something to ask, uh, certainly we'll uh, unmute and, and pose the questions. But Lynn, I want to recognize that you are actually in California, um, Northern California. Um, and so before we get into kind of the topic at hand, uh, really want you to uh, you know, share with the audience here, what is it that you're doing in Northern California with respect to the Tribal Resource Center? And generates revenue. And, uh, yeah, do the mute. And, um, and then more about that, because I know you're working with uh, uh, People Centered Internet, uh, which is a nonprofit that StarTides uh, collaborates with. And we had Maylin Fung, uh, the, uh, uh, the head of uh, PCI as a speaker. But uh, first, Lynn, kind of let us know uh, what you're doing in California and, and how does that play into the topic at hand? Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, so actually, <clears throat> we are here at the Yurok Reservation along the Klamath River uh, north of Eureka, California, uh, to, close to the uh, Oregon border. 
And one of the projects that is uh, that Mason has been George Mason and CRASC have been doing to support the people centered internet is actually in response to a grant from the Internet Society Foundation uh, on building digital opportunities in underserved communities, in particular, in this case, Native American communities. And so we've been looking at ways to not just focus on the technology, but focus on uh, design thinking principles of what uh, communities actually need, uh, and then working our way down through the resources and the governance, and only then do you get to the technology. So this is what they call a broadband boot camp, where they have representatives from several tribes and uh, several organizations are supporting them, actually going through how you would uh, uh, decide what kind of network you would want, how you would set it up, whether fiber, whether um, uh, yeah, whether radio, whether satellite, whatever. So it's really, really an interesting exercise of being able to get together and meet the people on the ground who are working on these kind of projects. So the topic of today's discussion, it's been the theme, including uh, the Star Tides demo that we just held at George Mason University uh, a few weeks ago, is Star Tides in a world of interconnected disruptions. Um, I'd love to have you kind of talk more about the history of Star Tides, what led up to its, its foundation, uh, its founding over at National Defense University, and kind of walk us through um, because we do live, we're always living in a world of interconnected disruptions. I think it's become more profound because of COVID. Of course, if we're talking about uh, Native American reservations, um, just the, when, it, when I think of interconnected disruptions, of course, is the broadband, uh, where, where in, in candidly, in many areas in the United States, it wasn't even connected. So uh, that's a broad question to you, but uh, take us through kind of the history and what uh, Star Tides is, is dealing with in the world of interconnected disruptions. So in 2007, I was leaving several years, I'd been the Office of Secretary of Defense and moving over to the National Defense University. In the course of that transition, my, my good friend, uh, Jim Kraft, who's actually on the call today, who had returned from um, a tour as telecommunication advisor in Afghanistan, uh, suggested some ways to use commercial off-the-shelf technology in support of missions such as uh, domestic and foreign disaster relief, building partner capacity, support to stability peacekeeping operations. And uh, because I was going to National Defense University, there was an opportunity for me to pursue that in an academic environment. Uh, and that's what led to uh, what's now become Star Ties. So we started off in 2007 uh, looking at those four areas. Uh, people today think of Star Tides as mainly as, uh, as a demonstration held annually, but that's only a very small part of it. And during the early years, we uh, during you know, most of its time, uh, we spent on actual real world uh, activities. So can you give us, I mean, Star Tides has done uh, quite a bit. In fact, let me uh, put in the chat here, um, the link uh, for people if they want to go to uh, to the Star Ties website, um, but um, can you talk more about some of the things Star Ties has done, like the Haiti earthquake of of of, of twelve years ago, uh, the tsunamis both in Indonesia uh, as well as uh, Japan, some of the other work that Star Ties has done. Well, the uh, the two thousand and four Boxing Day tsunami in uh, and South, uh, South and Southeast Asia predated Star Tides, but actually provided a lot of the basis for its thinking, along with some civil military exercises we had done um, with, uh, uh, with names like um, uh, Strong Angel and uh, Golden Phoenix and things like that. So there was a fair amount of uh, thought ahead of this. What we began doing, the first thing we did was shortly after Star Tides began in, in September of 2007, was a cyclone Sitter hit Bangladesh. And it was a very serious uh, cyclone. Uh, but one of the issues was there was a lot of, uh, the, the people who were working on it were not able to get any overhead imagery, any satellite imagery related to the disaster. And there was a lot of imagery available. But what was happening is the companies were selling the imagery to the government at very preferential rates, but with the understanding that the government wouldn't release it to compete with them. Um, what we were able to do is to work with the companies and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency uh, 
to get the imagery released at no cost to the um, uh, first responders for anyone to work on a disaster for the first 30 days. Um, similar cyclone Nargis in, uh, in Myanmar in 2009. Um, in 2010, as you mentioned, the Haiti earthquake, which led to an awful lot of uh, innovative work on things like open source geospatial uh, crisis mapping. Uh, we wound up helping develop a tool called the Pre-Positioned Expeditionary Assistance Kit that brought rapidly deployable communications and water uh, to and power uh, that could be deployed in 24 hours to disaster type areas. Uh, we were involved in Fukushima, the, uh, uh, of course, the uh, Japanese earthquake, tsunami, and uh, nuclear accident in 2011, 2012 in Superstorm Sandy. And one of the key elements of this was we participated frequently in quarterly exercises in California uh, at Camp Roberts, which is a National Guard base here, but allowed us to actually get out in the field and work with some of these technologies, see how they integrated with the military, and uh, gave, again, much more of an operational focus to what we're doing. And one of the unique things about Star Tides is that everything, uh, as I describe it, operates in the, in the open source. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, why was that set up in, in such a way and what are some of the challenges and, and opportunities that creates uh, in open source? And of course, you know, uh, open source uh, has, has become a little bit more mainstream in the daily lexicon of people uh, as we've seen what's taking place uh, in, in Ukraine uh, that, uh, and, and the movements of either military uh, uh, personnel or equipment, or some of the impacts on civilians. A lot of that data has been gathered through open source networks. But I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about the value of open source to start sites. Well, the value is that it's available. <laughs> uh, and so DOD Defense Department has a very active uh, research and development fielding acquisition program, which produces items that are uh, suited to various kinds of military needs. But in dealing with uh, the, the missionaries we were talking about, very often you're looking at civil military activities where the civilians either may not need or cannot afford the sort of military specified in, uh, systems that have gone through all the testing and, and maybe over engineered for what's needed for this particular project. So the idea was to take commercial off the shelf products largely uh, and apply them in uh, largely Defense Department-led activities. Uh, in the course of this, one of the things we found in Haiti, which for me was a particularly dramatic example, is that the military loves chains of command, chain of com chains of command, where you have clear-cut areas of responsibility. One of the things you will find in the most of the civil, one of the disasters, is you will never get unity of command. Uh, you will have uh, non-governmental organizations, you'll have aid workers, you'll have various the host country government, you'll have U.S. State Department, USAID, U.S. military. And so the question was, in addition to any equipment, how do you get unity of action when there is no unity of command? And that in itself was a really interesting um, uh, set of research uh, to pursue. So I think the idea was, first of all, how could you take things that are readily available that could be made available in the uh, environments that took advantage of the military's ability to deploy rapidly, provide logistics, but also didn't have to uh, rely on the expensive systems the military used. Let me share uh, also from the Star Size website is the uh, what we call the elements, and it's the uh, kind of the, the six areas, uh, platforms or technology areas, and I'd love to have you, Lynn. Uh, go more into detail specifically about how these play a relationship with each other, but then what are the risks and, and challenges when there is the interconnected disruptions and, 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 and how do we both prevent that and build resilience, but also a response to those uh, disruptions? One of the core uh, thought leaders in the early days of Star Ties. Um, was a grip by the name of Vinny Gupta. And Vinny is the inventor of the hexiert, which many of you know from Star Tides. So I'll talk more about that in a bit. But he has an interesting chart that says six ways people die. Too hot, too cold, 
hunger, thirst, illness, injury. Too hot, too cold is basically a heating, cooling, shelter problem. A hunger, thirst is a supply chain problem, essentially. And um, illness, injury is a safety, security, public health problem. And these led us essentially to the different infrastructures of startize so, uh, energy, uh, well, shelter, water and sanitation, uh, agriculture and food security, uh, public health and safety. But then these are underpinned by the areas of like energy and information communications technologies. And so those six elements in the, uh, the wheel basically are what we try to do to tie together. The idea is not to go in and I'm the water person, here's the best water thing you can get, or I'm the comms person on the best comms you can get. How can you tie those together in ways that get to say unity of action, unity of effort, uh, even though there may be no uh, chain of command. Uh, as you point out with interconnected uh, uh, disruptions, that's kind of the world we're in right now. We've been for a long time, actually. But, but the point again in CRASC is a transdisciplinary center at George Mason. Transdisciplinary meaning not just individual stovepipes, but actually trying to generate new knowledge and create new ways of thinking by looking thinking across these uh, different uh, areas. So StarTide's by trying to focus on these is after all a knowledge sharing network. It's a global network of several thousand nodes that brings together people with lots of different expertise. Uh, what CRASC does, it allows you to focus on individual projects. Uh, and the combination of the two together, the global knowledge and star tides and the focus of CRASC uh, allows for pretty strong combination that lets you mix and match the different knowledge elements and apply them to specific problems, specific problems. I want to acknowledge uh, Jim uh, Kraft's uh, comments here in the chat. Uh, first, he just put, shared a, a link uh, to uh, Vinay's uh, Six Ways to Die. And, uh, and, and we do have that, that chart we've made, uh, which uh, uh, I realize we don't have an image of, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get that and, and, and share it, make that electro uh, shareable electronically. Um, Jim also talks about uh, his comment about uh, having to leave things uh, in market uh, or in country um, and sometimes, you know, more temporary uh, than uh, people anticipate. Uh, I, I remember uh, during uh, the Haiti earthquake of, of 2010, 2011, um, that uh, where, where I had a, a business interest um, that uh, things were flown in, you know, within a few days, but a lot of those materials uh, just from humanitarian support uh, end up, you know, having to, you know, uh, be utilized uh, for months, if not years. And so uh, I think that's an important thing is that uh, the, the rebuild and stabilization tends to last uh, much longer uh, than anticipated. But uh, I do want to point that out. Um, next question I want to focus on going a little bit deeper into the interconnected uh, areas and the six, in, in the six uh, stovepipes, as, as you call them. Um, where do you see, I mean, they're all important, but where do you see looking forward um, are some of the greater challenges um, in, in when it comes to either, particularly in building resilience. That if we look forward and, on, and using the terms sustainable resilience, um, where do you see are some of the immediate needs um, and in, in what markets? So one of the first questions is what is resilience? And I think Elise Miller Hooks, who's a professor at Mason, has summarized this very nicely, which is coping capacity plus adaptability. Uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, um, will define resilience as uh, basically anticipate, uh, withstand, recover, and adapt. And so in this case, uh, anticipate, withstand, and recover uh, are the coping capacity. And then the particularly important is how do you pivot to uh, take advantage of the new normal, new post-disruption normal. And what we like to think about is not building back or bouncing back to the pre-crisis status quo, but how do you leverage the stresses and shocks to wind up stronger? So be prepared. I think we got, 
Did Lynn freeze on us? I'm sorry? You, uh, you froze a little bit, but you're, you're back. Can you hear me now? So yes, last part was be prepared to bounce forward better. Be prepared to bounce forward better. And what is the role and relationship? Because uh, that's one of the challenges uh, of Star Tides is that it's, you know, it's got it's got supporting of from the private sector and academia, but it also bridges through separately through ties with the Department of Defense. What do you see as that relationship and and what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, in, in in that relationships uh, in the past and being mindful of in the future? Where we started in uh, 2007 was the project was actually called Tides. Transformative Innovation for Development Emergency Support. And it supported those mission areas I mentioned earlier. Uh, as we went along, the idea of having a network um, grew in importance. And so the STAR is sharing to accelerate research. So the STAR Tides is actually the global network, whereas the Tides, if you will, is the, the original Defense Department program. When I left National Defense University in 2014, uh, we, we moved uh, Star Tides to Mason, actually in 2016, uh, but we left the uh, Tides part with the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And this has a number of advantages because Tides being a Defense Department program lets us go, for example, to the Pentagon and say, here we have a DOD effort, uh, can you give us support? At the same time, we can go to Mason and say, Star Tides is a Mason effort, uh, what can we get support from the, the university and from the academic community? So I think that combination of the Defense Department component tides and the Global Knowledge Sharing Network Star Tides has been a useful combination. John Crowley mentions a name um, that uh, many of, this, of us on this uh, chat will recognize, and that's, uh, um, so I'm trying to do two things at once here, uh, try to get a link out. Uh, let me get the link out first and then I'll go back to it. So this is the uh, UN Global Pulse link, um, which gets to the next question here. Um, and Robert Kirkpatrick, uh, who's uh, involved with the UN Global Pulse, um, uh, very interesting. But this gets to a question about uh, data. And uh, a lot of decisions are being made across just about every facet about data analysis. Um, and it's creating great opportunities, but it's also creating some challenges because data, they say data is the new oil. That is true, but oil also has to be refined. It's, you know, you just can't get it out of the ground from a well, it has to be processed and refined. And, uh, and, then, and then depending on how you refine it, um, then it's used for certain purposes. Uh, and uh, if it's used for a purpose that's not attended, then it's, it's junk. I think that's probably a better analogy with data. So I'd like to get a sense, uh, Lynn, of, of what, where does data fit into the decisions that are being made in resilience and with star tides and in the various fill pipes, uh, uh, and whether it's a collecting of data through uh, connected devices, uh, like energy, um, or some of the uh, other aspects about uh, the data of, of behavior uh, use uh, that's in market. So a couple of different answers on that. But first of all, uh, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> that we, or actually maybe Paul mentioned that we, we work with the People Center Internet <clears throat> and they're a very close partner with Star Tides, but also uh, with CRAS. And one of the core focuses of People Center Internet is how to make community data work for community good. Uh, and the point being that uh, lots of times, there's a lot of data being collected in communities, uh, tra credit card transactions, uh, uh, subway uh, uh, transactions, uh, uh, real estate transactions, so on and so forth. But lots of times it's going off to support corporate interest rather than the members of the community. And in particular, it's not often doing a lot to enhance the ability of small and medium sized enterprises in the community to thrive. And so one of the efforts that, uh, that CRASC is doing, and sorry, that the people, people saying it is doing, but also StarTide is supporting this idea of community data for community good, which is part of the effort here in the Native American communities where I'm at at, at UROC. Um, with regard to 
the sort of interactions. Uh, we've been doing some very interesting work, uh, both through uh, through CRAS, but also some other elements of Mason, on something called complex adaptive threats. And the point here is what happens when you have cyber attacks that occur concurrently with natural or man-made disasters. Uh, of course, the disaster focuses everyone's attention, which offers opportunities for uh, cyber attacks to either increase the damage or uh, have, impose environmental problems or whatever you want to do with it. So th there are certainly many interconnections among the, the different parts of the infrastructures. One of the things that particularly strikes me, which goes beyond the present uh, six uh, elements, is the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, has postulated that the converging accelerating technologies are actually going to blur the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological worlds. And I think you see that happening all the time. And we're, you know, you just look at the amount of um, uh, biomedicine that depends on some form of uh, data and the computing and, and, and that, and you know, look at the way new materials are being made and, the, uh, and again, the interaction of cyber with everything. So Mason actually anticipated some of this. I'm not sure it was conscious or not, but they, they have three institutes, an Institute for Sustainable Earth, an Institute for Digital Innovation, an Institute for Biohealth Innovation, which actually gives them very strong footing in these three digital, physical, biological worlds. So I, I think what we're gonna see in the future is maybe some, some additional adaption and the interdependencies uh, to include uh, the, the digital, the physical, the biological worlds, as well as the present elements. Um, excellent. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, but I want to give the opportunity if, if the uh, people that pose the questions, feel free to unmute. Um, Anna, uh, you've got a good question. Did you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it directly? Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, and thank you for the interesting speech. Uh, well, um, I would like to ask, uh, um, especially about, about the cultural, uh, well, uh, aspects. Uh, so, in relation to resilience term, especially, what would be the importance of uh, cultural determinants? In, well, when we are talking about building community resilience, what would it be? So my view is sociology always tops technology. If you don't get the, the culture part of it right, you're going to, uh, you're going to fail however big your technology is. And that again is one of the things that's been really, really interesting in, in this work in the Native American communities is, is uh, the extent to which the project has morphed from where it was when we started a year ago. Um, the, uh, a point that we've tried to develop over time is that in order to work in communities, you know, most of us have to work through trusted interlocutors, trusted intermediaries. I mean, I can walk into any Native American uh, uh, tribal council in America and be treated as another old white guy come to lie to us. So how do you find the, the, the for example, the tribal resource center that we've, we're setting up here is actually led by a, uh, by a, a woman from the uh, Standing Rock tribe of, uh, of the Sioux. Uh, and the, the course that we had planned to teach original design thinking is compl has changed completely because the pedagogy of an Eastern European university just does not match with the way you communicate with the tribes. Uh, and I think that's the key point is uh, one of the things we tried to do early on was to work in Appalachia. Uh, and that honestly did not go well because we never succeeded in establishing the rapport uh, across the, the boundaries with the, with the people in Appalachia. At the same time in Puerto Rico, uh, after several false starts, we've done well by finding the Puerto Rico Science Technology and Research Trust as our, as our trusted interlocutor to address the issues of the island and match them to what we're trying to do. So in answer to your question, the culture is the absolute key to it, but that has to adapt to each situation. There is no one size fits all. Uh, just parenthetically, one of the reasons why we tend to work at community levels is lots of times the nation state is too big and the family is too small to address the kind of problems we're dealing with. Now with a community, 
while there obviously are differences inside the community, you typically have common language, common standards of dignity and justice and fairness. And I include diasporas in the, in the community. And so it, um, one of the original questions that we were trying to answer was, what are the security implications of the replacement of labor by automation and artificial intelligence between now and about 2030. And for countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, good deal, aging, declining workforce. What does it mean for the countries with large youth bulge areas, Mideast, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, if there are tens of millions of young people with no entry level jobs and has no stake in the system. Uh, and so the idea is we, we saw the you know, million refugees you nearly know, overwhelmed the European political system in 2015 or Ukraine aside, but, um, and this is potentially many times more than that. So what could we do at the community level to reduce pressures for migration and marginalization? And so that remains part of the focus. But again, it, it starts with the culture. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Yeah, great question, uh, Anna, thank you. Uh, Michael Russell, um, you've added a couple of things here. I'd love to go ahead, sir. Hi, everyone. Uh, don't want to uh, monopolize the group's time, uh, just expanding on what I put in the chat box. Good to see old friends and, and new here. Uh, so I work with a um, public-private partnership called InfraGuard. I also do work as a contractor for uh, Glenn Thompson, the ranking member on the Agriculture uh, Committee as well. And uh, uh, per your question, Aaron, uh, my question is how can public-private partnerships like InfraGuard, which is a uh, kind of the redheaded stepchild of the FBI and uh, a bunch of folks in the uh, critical infrastructure industry, uh, which are really focused primarily on the security of permanent domestic infrastructures. But how can we leverage uh, the the smarts of so many of these these folks that I work with who who do that stuff across all sixteen uh, critical infrastructures, which uh, the federal government has identified. Uh, that's great for things like securing the grid and military defense space, but how can we uh, potentially work with folks like Dr. Wells and StarTides to deploy that expertise in scenarios where we have uh, disaster response and recovery scenarios? Interestingly enough, uh, I just had a call from Chuck Mantle this morning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so. So, I mean, public-private partnerships, I think, is absolutely essential, but at the same time, they're complicated. Um, the, for, for me, one of the most um, you know, impactful moments was years ago, I was up at um, uh, the AT&T Long Lines headquarters in Bedminster, New Jersey, and they had this eye-watering set of uh, large screen displays about every every element of the network and 15 second time hacks about how it was responding and everything else. Wow. And at this point, um, and they said, look, Lynn, um, suppose we get really badly hacked. Suppose we really screw up and do you gubbies really think you could come in here and run this network for us? And the answer was no, there's no way you could do this. And so the question is, how do you put together some kind of a partnership? And this, this is a cyber issue, of course, but it deals with almost everything where mm -hmm. Um, you know, the government brings to the table what it can best do, which in those cases to be information about what's going on and things like that, uh, maybe uh, suggested uh, defenses, and let the or private sector, you know, run their network. Um, you see this in, you know, across the 16 infrastructures. There's the vast majority of the infrastructure in the United States are privately owned. There's no way the government is going to do anything but leverage that. And so how do you find ways to leverage it positively rather than adding more bureaucracy and more impediments to the process? Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, I took a course some years ago from the World Bank and Public Private Partnerships, and they actually, they actually went through how badly you can screw this up. I mean, mm -hmm. there are lots of public private partnerships that have just been catastrophically bad. So just say public-private doesn't answer the question, but it seems to me public, the public-private is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Uh, so how do you find a way to make it work? Yep. Well, Dr. Wells, as you know, we, InfraGuard's been around for 25 years, and so there's a, a cadre of just some amazing folks that 
uh, want to help and can help. So I'm, I'm certainly open to anyone's uh, insights and suggestions. Thank you, Michael. Uh, appreciate that, your, your thoughts. Um, I see uh, Ken Gilgren's on the on the call, a good friend of mine of a long time uh, in Seattle. And I think, I don't know if Ken, you'll, you'll remember, uh, one, of, one of my trips to Haiti, I got back, I think you and I met uh, in Seattle, I think the next day. And we we're talking about public private partnerships. And I remember just saying, you know, this was back in 2007 or, or you know, probably 2007. And, you know, the public private partnership concept I was dealing with was let the private sector pay for everything and the government to collect the taxes. Um, and uh, I, I, I uh, so I, uh, I'm not, I'm hoping uh, things have improved on that sense, although I've not been in Haiti in a long time, but that was the case in many areas in Africa. So with that little side comment, you know, uh, Lynn, I do want to ask you, um, what are some of the geopolitical challenges that, that you've encountered, Startize has encountered, um, and the, the network has encountered? Um, you know, you, you talk, you know, you named off some countries and, and you know, but those, like Japan, South Korea, some of the Western Europe, you know, those are countries that have fairly uh, 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 synonymous rule of law systems and, and, uh, and, and uh, forms of government. But of course, you know, you're dealing with uh, countries where they might not have those institutions and those frameworks. Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that's been experienced and what's some of the advice uh, being mindful of as, as we uh, you know, move uh, star tides to, in, uh, to the future. I think Cyclone Nargis in, in Myanmar in 2009 was a great example. And, and uh, even then, as it sort of is now, uh, Myanmar was sort of a, um, was, a, was an outlier in the international stage for domestic human rights. And so uh, there was a lot of resistance, both on their part to accepting aid from parts of the international community, especially the United States, and also from the US concern about just how much to get involved in this. And so we saw very early on uh, that you know, the, the ability to support a tropical cyclone in Asia, which was fairly straightforward with Cyclone Sitter in Bangladesh, was completely different in, uh, uh, in uh, Myanmar. And just once again, reiterated that the culture is, you know, the, the, the sociology always tops the technology. You've got to, you know, put it in the political context. Um, I think this, uh, one of the interesting things going forward is, as we watch the fragmentation of the internet, uh, into it's not just a it's not just authoritarian versus liberal democratic model. Um, and clearly, you have the Chinese and the Russian view of, of of what the internet should look like. But even between the U.S. and Europe, the, the U.S. tends to favor uh, autonomy by private companies, whereas the Europeans are much, much more skeptical about uh, the motives of companies you see and things like the general data protection regulations. So I think just finding a way to, to navigate those, the, those different areas uh, is going to be a recurring challenge going forward. Appreciate those uh, insights. Uh, John Crowley, uh, you've got a pretty good question here. Do you want to go ahead and pose the, uh, in, uh, the question live? Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, John. Um, hey, Lynn, it's good to see you. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about the interstitial innovation. Tides has played a role in building up this creative space between sectors um, from the time Strong Angel all the way through uh, some of the work we did together on Camp Roberts. Um, but that place for beginning to build um, creativity, uh, a space to be able to at least articulate shared problems and approach those solutions is one which um, it, it's fairly rare to find, and we lost some of it in the midst of this this past decade. Could you talk a little bit about the role that that, that Star Tides has played and where it might be headed? Well, uh, yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because actually Eric Rasmussen uh, asked me something similar not too long ago, and and for me one of the most uh, innovative spaces we had. Uh, was things like Camp Roberts, the, the quarterly field explorations out at uh, Monterey, where you could uh, bring together both government and commercial and non-governmental. Uh, for me, one of the 
more dramatic things is what you did out there with the Civil Air Patrol uh, imagery, and uh, which basically looking at different ways. It turns out most of the imagery, much of the imagery post disaster in the United States is taken by our Civil Air Patrol. And the, and the altitude at which they flew and the types of pictures they took uh, was significantly improved by some of the work that was done at Camp Roberts under John's leadership in, I think, the summer of 2012, uh, which turned out to be just before Superstorm Sandy. Uh, another example was we had um, one time when there was, uh, I'm sure I have the companies wrong, but it was like a, um, a Lockheed Martin sensor being flown in the north of Grumman drone using a Raytheon data link um, that was put together in about three days with companies who never thought about working together on that before. And that kind of space is something I think we'd like, to, we, we need. And so uh, there have been a couple of discussions over the past few months about how we could get back to recreating that space. Um, part of it is I like to bring Camp Ro uh, Star Tides back to Camp Roberts, but also uh, could you set up a place for experimental innovation specifically in the star tide space about humanitarian assistance, disaster relief and building capacity and things like that. So there may actually be some opportunities out in the Pacific over the coming year. Uh, and uh, I'd like to explore those. Part of the problem with that is a long way away and costs money to get there. But um, the other thing that's happened is in Japan has established a very, very interesting flooding test bed outside Hiroshima. And they've invited us to come out and play any way we'd like to there. So I think there's some opportunities. The question is just you know, how do we get the resources and, uh, and bring the teams together to play? Yeah, this is Jim Kraft. I also want to mention that we actually have an opportunity uh, because a lot of the disaster response is kind of driven by what was the last thing that happened that was big that upset the country and got everybody's attention you know whether it's Katrina or a tsunami or whatever and we have had through the COVID experience the first recognized national widespread disaster in this country that lasted for an extended period of time and some would argue that it's still there so you know one of the questions is what do we do realizing that there are vastly increasing risk? I mean, we see that with uh, what's going on in Ukraine and threats of use of nuclear weapons and a variety of other factors. Uh, I, I just will mention that uh, I'm currently now at, got asked to move from DOD to the Office of Personnel Management, and I'm working uh, there. One of the duties I have is we're trying to put forward a new way of doing disasters, which is shelter in place. Basically, how do we use telework lessons and the new technologies uh, move to the cloud, space-based uh, broadband communications, et cetera, to have it where people can do a lot of their coop cog duties while operating at home with their families. Coop, coop, has, coop is kind of operations, cog is kind of government, right? Right, I'm sorry. I, See, I've, I've been too far out of the private sector. I speak in acronyms. So I know industry does that too. Everybody speaks in acronyms. Um, but, you know, I think that what we need is to have people actually come together and look at how we pull it together into real operational mile, models and pilots to show that it can be done and then promulgate that. Because I think there are a lot of people that realize that we're more at risk now as a society than we've been probably since the early 80s. Over. Thanks, Jim. Good, good insights, Jim. Thank you. Um, Hannah, you posed a question. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask it live. And uh, go ahead, Hannah. Sure. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, th I feel like you've covered this in some of your responses to some extent, Lynn, but one of the challenges that I know we've talked about a lot is the challenge of stovepiped responses to disasters. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts or stories you could share related to best practices or situations where you really saw a great integrated response that maybe there are lessons we could pull from or just any general thoughts if you haven't seen that amazing exemplary <laughs> situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I'm just I, as you've asked the question, I'm trying, trying to think of uh, the one where I point to aha. <laughs> you know? And uh, th there are many more examples of things that, uh, that should have done, been done better. Um, which of course in, in uh, generated lessons learned so there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that but i think the um i need to Hanna, let me think about that and get back to you i, I honestly could not say voila here is the here's a perfect example that we choose to go forward rather than here's one that generates some more lessons learned that uh, we could fold into the way ahead so thank you for the question i need to think about that yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. And in fact, uh, Kitty here, uh, let me uh, resend it, uh, did a chat here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. We are uh, two minutes uh, to go into this. Um, would welcome, uh, I've got one question, but does anyone want to take the last question? Um, and before we uh, conclude today's session. Hearing none, let me pose the question that kind of Hannah alludes to and is, is going back to the geopolitical, what kind of collaboration? I mean, NATO literally, uh, as we speak, is the map of NATO is being reworked. Um, uh, you know, the European Union is being reworked because of Brexit. Uh, uh, various, uh, um, you know, trade agreements, uh, in uh, to the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreements as becoming more geopolitical um, uh, versus economic. Um, what do you see, does that create challenges and opportunities uh, for start sites? Well, I think there's always, always both, but the, um, I read a really interesting piece the other day about the extent to which Vladimir Putin is being isolated as a pariah uh, because of the actions in Ukraine. And the answer turns out to be that uh, for the majority of the population of the world, he is not being uh, isolated nearly as much as he is in the Euro-Atlantic Alliance. Uh, and this in part is because, uh, I mean, obviously China has, uh, has reservations about uh, sanctions and as does India but also a large part of the world has uh, mixed uh, emotions towards uh, the legacy of the uh, European colonial era. And so the Admiral Fogo, who runs the uh, uh, Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League, spent uh, several years as the commander of Naval Forces in Africa. And he makes the point that trust cannot be surged talking about surging forces in response to a crisis, his point is that trust can't be surged. You need to build it up over time with repeated engagement and demonstrating that you're, uh, you're doing something in their interest, not just in your own interest. And I think that's in a space where star tides uh, should be able to, to, to make contributions. Very good. I will conclude with the announcement that uh... The uh, next uh, fireside chat uh, will take place on Wednesday, June 22nd uh, on the interconnectedness of resilience and emergency management with uh, Tanya Thornton. Uh, and uh, Dr. Thornton uh, lives in Virginia. Uh, she's a principal of Delta Point Solutions and uh, has been affiliated with uh, George Mason University for uh, uh, several years. Uh, and so we hope uh, you'll join us. It'll be at an earlier time. It'll be at two o'clock Eastern, recognizing that uh, summertime is approached and people may want to get out and enjoy the summer weather, uh, particularly those on the uh, East Coast. So I uh, hope you're able to join us uh, for that time. Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wells. Uh, it's a great conversation and uh, look forward to seeing uh, everyone in about a month's time. Have a great day. Nice to you, Aaron. Aaron. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for all your hard work putting this together. And Lynn, good seeing you uh, with that incredibly wonderful background. Doesn't look like a an Indian nation at all in the uh, <laughs> you know West. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Go, go, go it's back. a lot different than I imagined. <laughs> right. No.